Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm here with Kate Gartner. Kate, welcome. Hi, thanks, Michael. It's good to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited for our, our conversation. Uh, Kate, you are the founder and CEO of Triple Win Advisory, where you uh, consult on sustainability, among other things. You have over 25 years of experience, uh, kind of in corporate and entrepreneurial uh, endeavors, uh, from founding other companies to working as a, an adjunct professor. You're also the author of the new book, upcoming book, depending on, on time, uh, called Planting a Seed, Three Simple Steps to Sustainable Living. So we'll get more into that going forward. We're definitely gonna talk about how consultants can build a sustainable or more sustainable business that would maybe soften their impact uh, on the planet. But before we do that, let's kind of go back into, in time to when you got started. Before you began the consulting business, Kind of walk us through like what's your educational background and, and what were you doing before you started uh triple win advisory okay you want to go you want me to go way back i do yeah like take me take take me as far back as you can okay uh well i am from northern virginia right outside of washington dc i have three degrees so i have an undergraduate degree in poli sci and economics from dartmouth college and from which is in New, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went uh, back to get my MBA about five years later from the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School. And I focused there on entrepreneurial management and strategic marketing. And then the last uh, degree that I have is a master's of science in sustainable management from the University of Wisconsin. And mm. that helped me focus myself on getting into corporate sustainability and business circularity. And what, what pulled you in that direction? Why? Because it sounded like the first two kind of degrees weren't necessarily focused on, you know, sustainability, the environment. Uh, and then the last, it very much is. Yeah. What was happening in your life that, that pulled you in that direction? A really good question. So I graduated from undergrad and my MBA not thinking about sustainability at all. What I was thinking about when I graduated from MBA was wanting to be an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. um, my, I had gotten really steeped in Tibetan Buddhism and uh, really went deep in my yoga practice. And I thought, you know, because I had been an athlete all my life. So I had been a three sport athlete. I had played um, um, collegiate basketball at Dartmouth. Uh, but I also had a lot of, um, you know, physical pain. And so mm -hmm. I, you know, yoga was my way out of that. And it was really enlightening. And so when I went back to get my MBA, I was getting a 360 view of how businesses operate successfully. Uh, usually at the, the larger level, right? The public company mm -hmm. level. But I knew then that I wanted to try to start my own business. And it took me a couple of years after I graduated from Wharton to do that. But I went in and um, said, I'm going to be a, a designer, a manufacturer and seller of women's sustainable activewear. And at the time, sustainability was was on the rise, right? You could you were you were seeing it in sort of building materials, you were seeing it in um, uh, architectural design and furniture, but it was a little bit out of reach. And I was like, you know, one way that I can potentially leapfrog my competitors, like a Nike, Adidas, Champions, and such, was to really go full hog on sustainability. So mm -hmm. that was my, because I knew I didn't have as much cash flow and I didn't have as much brand awareness in the market that they had. Um, so I was like, you know, why don't I actually try to launch a manufacturing company that is manufacturing women's apparel, it's a, almost 100% sustainable. And so I went in that direction as a strategic maneuver but getting into the manufacturing world is very opaque. It's a lot of waste at all points uh, in the value chain. Um, and, you know, you have to, we, we, manufacturing, especially textile manufacturing has gone so deep into just in time uh, mm -hmm. manufacturing. And then to, to, to lower the cost structure per unit, uh, we ship everything abroad, and then you, you know, you're required to, um, to, to, to basically manufacture just huge right. volumes of inventory. Yeah. 
And then you have to figure out what to do with it. So there's just, I, there was a huge eye opener for me. And then I just kept on feeling kind of grossed out by that, that prospect of trying to figure out how to move inventory that um, it didn't necessarily want to produce, but it just it made a, it, it, it was a, it was a cost decision. And, and what happened to that, to that business? Um, so it was growing really well. I established it in sort of mid 2006. Um, the business plan was to you know, open up my own um, stores, manufacture and then sell wholesale and direct e-commerce. Um, and then the great recession hit. So <laughs> I, I was manufacturing, I had wholesale accounts that were growing um, pretty, pretty well. I also had an e-commerce um, function to it. Uh, uh, I think I said I had a flagship store in, in Brooklyn, New York, but the Great Recession hit and we were sort of at the epicenter of that. So it was a really tough go. I was able sort of to maneuver through that and yeah. survive, but not necessarily to thrive. Right. There, you know, I wasn't a high tech company. I wasn't sort of a digital marketplace. Um, so it was really hard to um, raise capital. Mm -hmm. uh, for what, what was the name of that company? It was called Omala. O-L-A-L-A, LLC, but it was hard to raise capital at that point. That's yeah. when everything, you know, the Angelus came in and the crowdfunding came in as a response to the Great Recession a couple of years right. later. So yeah. when through that experience, I mean, is that like what I'm really wanting to ask is what, what then led you to start your own consulting business? And so 2018, right, fast forward, you start Triple Win Advisory. Yeah. What happened between that manufacturing business and you decided to start the consulting business. How did you actually get into start uh, Triple One Advisory? A lot of things happened. So we, we moved out of New York to Europe. We moved to Amsterdam, my family and I. Um, so I got a different perspective on sustainability. I was steeped in sustainability, even growing more so. And people kept on asking me um, to look further back into my upstream value chain with Omala. And I couldn't answer those questions or I didn't feel like I had influence over, hey, would you know a, a fiber company, would you actually create more sustainable fibers for me? Um, so I moved abroad. I went back to get my master's. I wanted to learn a little bit more fully um, around industrial ecology, so sustainable manufacturing. And that's what I focused on. So that was a two year program. Uh, and the reason I, I, I actually wasn't sure if I was going to become a consultant. So I had consulting work in my past. Uh, and I thought, you know what, when I started the program and sustainable management, I thought, hey, I would you know what, why don't I just take a, a chief sustainability officer job at a company and that, that would be a really good gig. And I quickly realized that that was probably too myopic of thinking and I wanted to have a more meaningful, impactful uh, experience on industry and how it manufactures. Gotcha. So, so I got into consulting. And when you decide that you're going to start consulting, you create this company, how did you go about getting your first few clients? What did that look like? Yeah. Uh, so I, you had mentioned, I started in 2018. I had finished just a quick uh, check back. I had finished my master's in the summer of 2017. And I had decided that I was going to write a book. So I had come back about a year prior from Europe, come to the United States. There was a change of administration and there was a lot of fear and concern around climate change. So I was like, you know, why don't I write a book? And um, it was, a, again, a strategic decision of mine. I also saw that a lot of entrepreneurs in New York, in a lot of different industries, once they wrote a book, they really catalyzed their businesses. So they became thought leaders themselves, but also it attracted new business and opportunities to their companies. Sure. So I set about writing a book. Um, in 2018, I had secured a book agent. So I was like, Phew, okay, I'll, I'll get the, the business up and running. I had an idea that I was really going to focus solely on business circularity and business transformation, like big mm -hmm. systemic change. And I set about, I got, I got, I had a small few clients come in through um, my professional networks. 
here in Oregon. But then I, I actively went out and started targeting companies I wanted to work for. So mm -hmm. big brand name companies of all different sizes that I felt like would be a really good fit for what I wanted to do with them. And right. they were like, yeah, that's great. No, we're not going to touch it with a 10 foot ball. Mm. What, what do you mean? So they, they were interested right in, to tell me more about that. Like what, what, what was, so this was initial outreach was not for you to, to consult for them. It was for you to maybe get a job in the organization. No, it was, it was to sell them services, consulting services to help them yeah. um, implement, educate and implement business circularity within their manufacturing operations. Right. So, so they, what, what are they, what was their response? You're saying that they were initially kind of interested, but, but said, no, tell me more about, about that. What was the mindset? What was the situation? It was, it was just, it was too much. Um, so I was asking them to consider hiring triple win to transform how they manufacture right? mm. and, the pro and how they um, design products. And they were like, no, I, I kind of, I, I mean, I get it, but we're not, we're nowhere near that right now. Hey, but are you interested? You know, we're, we're setting these climate neutral goals. Um, we're, we're starting to do carbon inventories. That's, you know, something that we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And that was part of my, I knew that that was, part of doing business transformation, but it wasn't a service I was providing, um, mm. what I call sort of a tool, tools in my toolkit. Uh, so I rejiggered. I actually had these conversations for about eight months with companies and it wasn't really resonating what I wanted to do for them um, right. in a whole host of ways. So yeah. I basically went back and I deconstructed my service offering right. yeah. into tranches that were very understandable, that had a lot of market awareness, like right. conducting a carbon inventory, right? So, so Kay, just to jump in for one second, what, what I'm hearing you say, because I think this is a very important point and one that we, we often kind of talk about with clients in our, our Clarity Coaching Program is around this idea that you know, you, when you get out into the marketplace, you don't necessarily know what's going to resonate or, or not, but by going out and having conversations, you're actually going to get the real feedback. So rather than just like staying in your office and planning what you think might work, when the rubber hits kind of, you know, meets the road, that's when you find out. So what I'm hearing is that you went out, you had these conversations, you initially said, Hey, I can help you with this big kind of program, or here's how I feel I can help you. And the feedback was, well, no, we don't want that, but we have these other things that maybe you could help us with. And so you took all that information through several months of different conversations, you took kind of that data and then you start to reconstruct your offerings based on what the marketplace had told you that they wanted. Is that correct? Yeah. That, what they were ready for. Exactly. Yeah. And so then when you, you did that, so you broke this apart, you now had new offerings based on what they, what the market has, had told you that they wanted. What did you do next? How did you get that back in front of those, those people? Like how did you move that to actually generating revenue? So I took, I, I did a free gig. I basically, and I, didn't, I mean, I basically told the client that I didn't tell anybody else that, but I wanted to get a case study under my belt that yep. was really juicy. So yep. I took the biggest offering that I knew was going to be the most compelling to the broadest number of companies and said, I'll do that for you. And they're like, oh my God, that's great because we were considering to do that, but we hadn't yet pulled the trigger. So and, and how important do you think it was that, that you approached them and said, I'll do this for like essentially for free, right? Without charging you. Was that the reason that they said yes? Like do, looking back, do you think you could have charged or how do you like with the benefit of hindsight, how do you look at that, that moment? Is there, do you do the right thing? Could you have done something different? How do you feel about that? I mean, did I, 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 I don't, I'm not a big believer in free work. I, I'm not right because I don't think things that are inexpensive or free are not valued. Right. But it was a trusted individual, and um, we had done conferences together. We had spoke on panels together. He really felt that um, I was an, an expert in his mind, um, mm -hmm. and I and. and I haven't talked about why he thought that, but it was related to the book and the companies I was going out and speaking to. And I said, well, I'd like to do this for you because I'm rejiggering my services. Um, you know, would you, and he's like, that would be really great, but do you want to get paid? I don't have a budget for you. Mm. That's fine right now. I'll do this for you, but here are the things that I want from you. Okay. And what, what were those things that you requested? that I could use their name in all marketing materials and I could develop a case study with their name on it. 
Mm. Now, before we move forward, because I, I love this, I want to go back in time a little bit. So you spent many months reaching out to ideal clients, offering something that you thought they, they might want. How, how did you even get people to accept to have a conversation with you? I mean, were you sending emails? Were you using LinkedIn? Were you using the phone? Were you getting uh, referrals and introductions from people that you knew? Like, just walk us through a little bit more tactical. How did you go to, because a lot of people even struggle with the idea of, you know, reaching out and, and getting a response, never mind having a conversation. So what, when you look back at that, what worked best for you to actually achieve conversations? I mean, I did a whole host of things. I went out and started going to events, being hosted by nonprofits and other organizations. I would always make sure that I had asked, you know, I would ask a insightful question. I would get people's cards. I would have coffees with them. But I think one thing that I don't have a struggle with, I don't have a problem with, is I always go to the top. So I'm not interested in talking to managers or even directors. Um, it's got to be VP and up. And, and where, I, where I've been the most successful is reaching out to the C-suite, often the CEO, if it's a company that's, you know, 100 million and less in revenue, that's mm -hmm. not possible necessarily for all the you know, bigger companies. But reaching out and say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. I'd like to have a conversation with you about your need. And I just want to introduce myself. Mm. And when you do that, in a situation where there is no referral or introduction, you're just reaching out kind of, as they say, cold. Um, do you still get a response when you're that direct? Or do you find that you, you, you definitely do need some touch points or introductions before you reach out directly to somebody like that? I mean, it's always helpful. I mean, I, I try to have relationships with people that are influential to the C-suite folks. Mm. Uh, so for instance, you know, our Oregon is sort of a hotbed of entrepreneurial startups, you know, smaller companies that haven't gone public. Uh, you know, uh, Brew Dr. Kombucha and Tofurky and Honey Mamas. I mean, these are all, and, you know, Salt and Straw, these are all smaller companies, mm -hmm. uh, nowhere near the size that, you know, I'm used to like in New York or Boston. Um, right. So there's a, a man that I met through a mutual Wharton connection and he um, heads up a venture fund here. So he invests in a lot of these companies at smaller scales. Mm -hmm. So because I have that relationship, I lean on him to say, hey, can you make an introduction for me to these these CEOs or COOs, right. or I mention, hey, I we have this person in common. I'd love to meet you so I can tell you a little bit more about me, and I'd love to learn about your business too. Got it. Okay, so now establish a relationship, that, and that's great. Thank you for for filling in those those blanks for me. Now let's fast forward back to the situation where you've done this free work, you've developed this case study, right, based on what what you saw. What happens next? How do you take that? How do you turn that experience and that engagement into client number two, number three, number five, and so forth? So just, just using the name of the brand and putting that case study out there um, in, a, in a very glossy professional way helps substantially. So then people mm -hmm. just assume that it's not one, that you've done this seven, 10, 20 times. Right. Um, the other thing is that while I was writing the book, none of this actually got into the end of the book. So I had to rewrite my manuscript, but I decided that I was going to take a tact of looking at future trends in business around corporate sustainability. So I reached out to CEOs of big, massive public companies, mm -hmm. um, you know, like Kaiser Permanente and right. Interface and Signify. And I landed interviews with those CEOs. It took a long time. It took like, 69 months to land those interviews, but I had them in the bank. And I also learned quite a bit about their approach to corporate sustainability and how they embed it. And so I would talk to other individuals and I would write my newsletters with that information. Like, Hey, just yeah. talk to the CEO of Signify. Here's what he says about sustainability. So there was, um, you know, there was a cachet that rubbed off on me because I uh, had that interview with those CEOs. Right. I, I love it. It's, it's um, I often refer to this as like implied endorsement, right? So it's not necessarily a direct endorsement, but it's kind of implied just because you've had that conversation with them. Uh, this is where podcasts in, in today's day work really well, right? To reach out to an, an ideal client and try and interview them. So you were doing something very similar with that. Um, when you look at your marketing now, so it sounds like the, kind of that case study, interviewing ideal clients, uh, just being out in, in, the, in the marketplace was how you got 
your first several clients in the business. What about today? I mean, you're, you're, you've grown from a solo consultant to now uh, a team uh, and, and a much larger company. What's working from a marketing perspective right now to, to generate more conversations and bring in more business? Yeah, really good question. What I have seen in just the last six months is that I'm getting a lot more cold you know, referrals, basically. People are coming to me and say, hey, uh, we want to talk to you about X or we want you to engage in an RFP process. Um, less RFPs, but... Um, I, you know, I still do tons of conversations. I still talk to, um, to I talk in uh, a lot of um, universities. Mm-hmm. So I've engaged my old professors or people who are professors at huge universities across the United States. And I talk to them specifically about corporate sustainability and business circularity. So I'm getting that cachet there. And then they hopefully, and they are talking to their colleagues and their networks within Mm -hmm. those those regions and and, and referring people my way. So I've gotten quite a few clients from that. Um, What else am I doing? Um, Oh my God, I'm just drawing a blank. Do you leverage that like in any way? So let's say you, you go to a university, you give a talk. Of course, it's wonderful when these professors or people there will, will spread your name and people then come to you. But are you and your team doing anything like to say, oh yeah, you know, uh, Kate just recently spoke at this place. Like, is that, are you promoting it through your newsletter, social media, uh, or, or not so much? I mean, every single time. I promote it through all my channels all right. the time because I take the advertising approach to um, brand awareness. You can't hit them once. You can't hit them twice. You have to hit them eight to 12 times. And um, the other thing I think that has been working and really getting my name out there uh, again is that, that it's, I'm constantly, I'm trying to constantly stay in front of my prospective audience. Mm. Um, and that's through a lot of workshops and webinars. So there was a huge pivot. So I created tons of content and I delivered that content every, every week. I mean, I, mm. I almost became a course company, a training company uh, when the pandemic hit, because I wasn't able to have face-to-face and people just didn't have the appetite to to talk about something that was non-core to their business. So, um, and I still do that. So I still try to run a lot of webinars and workshops on a regular basis, just to keep my brand out there. The other thing that I do, and I think has been very effective, but I can't, I can't, um, I can't uh, necessarily uh, say this A is connected to X. Right, so you can't attribute it. Business. I can't attribute yeah. it directly, yeah. but I write a ton of byline articles. I'm mm. always writing articles about the services that I provide, the approach that we take with clients, the trends that I see in right. um, industry, and I get them published. And I do think that that just builds uh, and and where, where is this being published? Is it being published in like industry publications or just other blogs. Like, give me a sense of, of the kinds of places that your content is being published. Yeah, it's Green Biz, it's Industry Today, so some, some verticals, uh, industry verticals, real leaders, Forbes, Fast Company. I mean, I like to have sort of that mass market touch, but I do need the verticals, like HR right. leader. Uh, yeah. So where it makes sense to have that vertical focus, uh, yes. but I do want a mass market appeal. And what about your webinars and the workshops? Is that done just through, like, are you marking that just to your own list? Are you partnering with other organizations, uh, associations? Like how, how are you getting your webinars and workshops out there in the world? I haven't done that. I, I do think that there is a play and opportunity just to get to a broader audience. Right. I like to bring on guests. And so I like to you know, build from their network. Right. Uh, right. But no, it's it's usually something that we create and we market through our own networks and, and right. my professional networks. Okay. So we're going to keep going. I want to dive into some of the stuff in, in your book and, and a few other things about your, your company itself. But One question that I think often kind of comes up is the world that you focus on to a degree, some people would think of like sustainability, that is not the most tangible. Uh, It's maybe a little bit harder to measure. It's can can you really see an impact in in the short term? And I'm wondering, how do you approach your pricing strategy and and your fees? 
Um, you know, if, if the work that you're doing, for example, directly increases revenue or sales or something that's, that's very easy to track, it's easier to start to connect return on investment value to your fees. How do you think about fees and your pricing strategy when it comes to sustainability? I mean, it's, I'm muddling through a little bit to be very perfectly honest uh, about that. But, and I know that my fees are growing over time as I build my brand awareness. But mm. from some of the services I provide, I'm just looking at the competitive, the, the competitive marketplace. What are they, um, how do they price their products and their services? And for some of them, it's all over the map. So then what I try to do is I try to articulate my unique value proposition. Mm -hmm. how, how our triple win services and the approach um, that we give to our clients, how is it uniquely differentiated um, to our competition? And I'll give you an example. So there, you know, sustainability is hot, right? The field of sustainability, uh, sustainability consulting is hot. Uh, but it's been around for a long while, for at least 40 or 50 years. And the first people, the first groups of people that jumped into this were environmentalists and or engineers. Mm -hmm. right? So they're the, the carbon accountants. Right. Um, and so they're still in the game and they're very busy. But I'm not an environmentalist. I am. But that's not the approach that I take with my clients. I am pro-business and I'm all about sustainability being value creating mm -hmm. and supporting and aligning with the strategic business goals of my clients. Right. Uh, the other, the, the, from an engineering point of view, I do uh, employ engineers, but they take a very... Um, you know, a U, a, they, they, they create a very strong UX so that what we do is very accessible to non-engineers, to marketing, comms people, people mm -hmm. that don't really deal with numbers all the time. Right. And so I think that's our unique value proposition is that our products and, uh, and the tools and the deliverables that we provide to our clients are very accessible to everyone. It, it also sounds like uh, what I'm hearing you is that to, to bridge the gap between something that might be a little bit kind of fuzzy, uh, you know, like sustainability to some, uh, you're really making sure that you're connecting the, the work that you're doing in that area to business value and the creation of greater value within the business. Like you're, you're bridging those two things together so that if you're going to do something in the area of sustainability, carbon, whatever it might be, it's going to be tied to a very clear kind of business goal or something on the business side as well, which can make it easier to justify an investment from an organization. Is that correct or anything else to add? I, I would, yes, I would say that it's, it's fuzzier than I would like, but I'm working with more organizations that want to go, that are pre-IPO, that right. are, that are ready to go public. And they are now, you know, they were going to go public without doing any sustainability work. And what they're finding is that the, the potential investors or prospective investors are saying, well, have you done anything around DEI? Have you actually, um, you know, calculated your your carbon footprint? And they're like, oh no, we haven't. So what we bring in is saying, listen, we can do all this work for you, and you can um, put all this information to your S one filings on on your road to becoming public, and this is going to help you actually land more investors and more money in the. Yep. Right. And there's also, I mean, there's countries, I believe the UK requires that in order to win like government contracts, you actually have to show that, that they're, you're doing some work around the environment and carbon footprint and, and so forth. So definitely this is, it's moving more and more in that direction. Uh, you, so you start your company yourself. Today, you have multiple employees and team members. When you started, I'm assuming you were doing all of the, the client and project delivery? Uh, it was, but I was contracting with some several individuals to help me. Did, did you hesitate at all to to bring on more people? Like a, a lot of uh, consultants, you know, founders of of their firms, as they're growing and they see the the need or they can feel the need to bring on more people, so that they're not the ones doing all the project and client delivery work themselves. There's a hesitation to do that because it's like, well. I'm, I'm the best, like who can do it as good as I can? Like, what if I don't provide the best experience for the client? 
did you have any of that kind of, you know, I like to call it head trash maybe, but it's just any hesitations or concerns around delegating project and client delivery? Uh, I'm not a micromanager. Uh, I, I am very protective of my brand. So it's important that my deliverables are uh, up to par, up to my standards. Uh, no, I'm a planner. So in fact, I maybe overthink. I, I look you know, two, three, five steps ahead and say, I know I'm going to need people. So I tend to not necessarily hire them outright, but bring them on and socialize our culture and, you know, uh, what kind what kind of work we do and the deliverables that we we provide to the clients and get them into the fold probably six to nine months in advance of when I think I really am going to need them full time. So does that is that does that take the shape of uh, of them being a contractor? So you are providing them with some kind of paid uh, you know activity or engagement, or are you just starting to build those relationships with people without actually engaging them in paid work to begin with? I mean, I think there's a funnel of bringing employees on full time. So mm. first, you're just trying to find really good talent. Yeah. And then you're talking to them over a long period of time about what Triple Win is trying to do and accomplish in the work that we do. Um, and then I bring them on as contractors. I see their work. Um, it hasn't always been successful. So some people have stayed and I've given them more work. And then I, I want them to, I, I try to figure out what they're really good at or what they really want to, to do, um, sink their teeth into. And I try to give it to them. So then right. I try to help, have them build that practice with my help. Um, but, you know, I've, I, I, I definitely test them out there. You know, I always do one test when they're, they're fully come on to a project. And if they don't really meet my standards, then they have to go. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think you might be hitting on kind of my next question, but if, if you were to identify one or two things that you've done over the lifetime of, of the company uh, relating to bringing on contractors and, and team members to take over the client and project delivery or to play a much bigger role in that, what, is, what are one or two things that you've done that you feel have really helped to maintain the standard that you would want to, to have in the business in terms of the, uh, the quality? Uh, I'm biased to hiring and working with really smart people. Uh, and, and pedigrees do matter. What do you mean by that in terms of I education? I mean, their, their educational pedigree. Mm. It matters to me. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've brought on uh, individuals that have said that they're, they're really good at what they do and they, they're really steeped in that, that world, you know, that maybe it's energy efficiency, maybe it's renewables. Um, and, but they haven't been very good at client facing. So mm. the other thing is if I'm going to grow in, in this business, the way I want it to grow, and I want to be able to delegate responsibilities to enough people, uh, they, they have to do really good work. They have to be knowledgeable of what they do. And they also have to be good in, in a client facing situation. Got you. As you've been doing more of this, you know, building the team, uh, numbers have increased, how has your day-to-day -day kind of role shifted? Like, what are you spending more time on now? Where as before, you know, it wasn't something you did as much of. Yeah, I've handed off one practice area that is running pretty smoothly now to an individual. Um, I hired a fractional sales or business development person. So he's doing all the sales funnel work, even though I'm closing the deals He's not there. He's not steeped in sustainability. Um, and then, um, what was I going to say? I, I, I'm, I'm right now, it's a very creative time for Triple Win and for Kate, myself. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to productize a lot of our services mm. so that it's, they're not time bound or human resource bound. I don't want to get rid of consulting, but I do want to productize yeah. what we have developed and have on-demand courses and on-demand workshops and portions of a carbon inventory where people can purchase it and do it on their own. And they can hire back Triple One if they need help or support. Right. Okay. That, that makes sense. And how about, I mean, you're looking back over the, the period of handing more and more stuff over, over to people. Is there anything that you feel like, oh, I made a mistake with that and I would definitely never do that again? Like for those who are going through that transition right now of being 
uh, either an independent you know, solo consultant or maybe just having one or two people, but they want to bring on more people to take over some of that client and project delivery. Is there anything that you feel is like a best practice, really, really important to do that has made a big difference for you? Yeah, I think this is true of most consulting firms. You have to template, you have to standardize the processes to make it easy for others to, to run with your assets. Yeah. Right? Um, I do think the trial period where you're indoctrinating them into a culture and a standard of operating uh, so that they can, I mean, they're not going to be just siloed on their own and sort of take over a, you know, a practice without understanding that it's part of the business, triple winning. Right. Um, I mean, I've, I've made mistakes. I mean, I thought I was going to develop this practice with this individual and um, I, the person wasn't up to snuff. And so I've had to really downplay that service offering uh, until I, fig I can figure out who to bring in or whether it's even necessary. Gotcha. So your new book, uh, Planting a Seed, Three Simple Steps to Sustainable Living, uh, the latest. Uh, as you've been going through that, if you look at you know your other experiences of, of writing books or kind of going through that process, what have you learned now? Any, anything new when it comes to either the creation of the book or the promotion of the book? I mean, it's, all, it's a whole world, a whole new world. Um, I see the book as not a, as a jumping off point. It was never the end goal, even though it's right. really nice to have- You're, you're, you're not making millions just from selling books. Heck no, that wasn't the point. I mean, everyone's like, uh, you know, you want to be a, an Amazon bestseller. And I'm like, maybe that's not my goal. My goal was to have it open up more doors, mm. have people see me as a sustainability authority so that I, they don't have to check five boxes to determine whether they want to hire triple win. They maybe right. just have to check one or two. Right. So yeah. it just makes it easy. It, 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 it brings more prospective clients to my door. It's mm. easier to close them. And then lastly, it's a jumping off platform for developing a bunch of different assets, again, that I can productize. And when you say that, you know, yeah, it's, it's helping you to bring in more, more leads and more ideal clients and then making the, the kind of the, the closing process, the sales process easier, what are you actually doing with the book, right? I mean, there's a lot of people who have books, doesn't really, doesn't help their business very much because they're not using the book to promote. Like, are, are you taking books are you sending them to, to people in the mail? Are you just letting Amazon do its thing? Like, wh what are you actually doing now that you have this book to, to help it to, uh, to help your business generate more business? I am, I've hired a, um, a publicist to help me land um, press around the book. And then I'm writing byline articles and they're helping me land those to get published. A lot of the byline articles have nothing to do with the book. Yeah. Um, they're more about corporate sustainability. Um, the press is around the book and, and how, you know, an approach to sustainability. Um, I am sending the book. I'm sending the book to anyone that I knew that I newly meet. And then I hand it to them and say, hey, it was really great to meet you. Um, would like you to have this. This actually is integrated into our workshops. If you want to learn more about blah, then yeah. do that. Uh, and then I'm also sending them to my existing or past clients to say, hey, just to keep um, keep me top of mind, keep Triple Win top of mind and say, hey, you know, is there anything else that's going on now? Anything that's changed that you want to have another conversation together? Right. And is that just through like um, uh, in the mail, like a print printed uh, cover letter type of thing? Or is how are you having getting that communication in front of people? I mean, I'm all about handwritten letters. So I, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, Beautiful. I mean, everyone is so inundated with email and, and digital assets that yeah. it's not as meaningful, but if you actually get a handwritten email or letter and it's in a, a package that you have to rip open, a lot of uh, you know, executives are now going back to their, their workplaces. That's going to be even more so in January. So people are starting to get packages again through the mail in their offices. Yeah, I think it's meaningful. Uh, uh, yeah. And I, I leave a card there and they usually always write me. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So I landed uh, um, an interview with Signify CEO, Eric Rondelet. But I went through their CSO, the Chief Sustainability Officer, who's a woman. 
And I decided that I was going to write a letter and then snail mail it to the Netherlands because that's where Signifies is located. And I got a, um, a call and an email from the CSO and she said, why did you decide to send it like snail mail? Yeah. And I said, because I knew you were going to get it. And this was before the pandemic, but I just, I knew you were going, it was going to land on your desk. And she said, that was really smart. Um, and so that actually just catalyzed the, my ability to actually to have a conversation with the CEO. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I find that in the, the world of consulting and advisory and so forth, sometimes, and actually quite often, the things that don't scale are the things that actually will help you to scale. Like the, so sending the, the print letter or the handwritten note, that's stuff that, yeah, it's very hard to automate authentically, right? Or in a real way, but the impact that can have is likely going to be a hundred times greater than sending, you know, a bunch of emails um, just because it does differentiate you. It shows you care a bit more. It does take more time, but it also usually per, uh, produces a much greater result. I, I want to, before we kind of get to a few questions before wrapping up, I want to ask you about consultants who want to be more sustainably kind of minded. They want to try and incorporate more sustainable practices into their business. Like is, is sustainability something that a small consulting firm can actually do something with? And if so, how, what would that look like? Or is this really only beneficial for, for larger organizations? Uh, there was, I think the shift with the pandemic to being virtually virtual and um, not traveling and teleconferencing and telecommuting um, was an, an odd thing for consulting firms to consider. Mm -hmm. But it works, right? The productivity remained high. You could still close deals. You could get things done. Uh, and I think that, that, that it's here to stay. So a consulting firm, their um, biggest carbon footprint is business travel, employee community and business travel. And, and, and probably maybe some purchase goods and services, right? The equipment and paper and stuff like that. But if you can make sure that everything that you buy, you either rent and you can give back or lease, um, you always think about post-consumer recycled content and how you purchase, right? So at least it's less of a, a carbon footprint on the materials. And then really consider not traveling or only traveling locally so you can keep your footprint low. Got you. Some great tips there. Uh, we're going to make sure people can learn a lot more about this from your book in just a moment. But before wrapping up a few questions that I always like to, to ask, uh, when you think about your daily habits and kind of what you tend to do every single day, are there one or two things that you feel have the greatest impact on your productivity, your performance, your mental clarity, just overall helping you to be successful, uh, whether it's, you know, yoga or reading or uh, some business practice that you have, what are one or two things that you just find yourself doing every single day that really help you to kind of be your best? I had to give up yoga during the pandemic. Uh, so uh, I always make a to-do list every night and then I literally check it off all the yeah. things and it feels good to at least get two thirds of it done. You're always going to pat, but every night I do that. And every morning I make sure it's still meaningful, right? Or something mm -hmm. else hasn't been added. Um, so that's really important to me. I think getting up early and having an hour, if not an hour and a half to myself without my children, just to think and kind of meditate over a cup of coffee um, is really enriching. And then because I can't do yoga, we live close to a, at a urban forest, large urban forest here in Oregon. So I tend to now take walks, especially when I'm having mental blocks. So when I'm overwhelmed, I'm super stressed and I've got too much to do, I, or I can't figure out how to think through something. I, I literally stop everything and I take, you know, it's even, it's got it to be a 35, 40 minute walk, but I take a walk and often I'm thinking about that and there's a breakthrough and I come yeah. back and then I solve that problem. Yeah. I mean, it's so amazing how changing environments can really help to somehow like th that issue or whatever's going on is it's either conscious up front or it's you know in the subconscious but just getting to that different environment somehow creates space for the mind to, to work itself through the problem um i'm a very big believer of that uh, as well uh over the last six months top kind of uh book that you've either read or listened to could be fiction non-fiction 
anything stand out as just something that you would, you would recommend you really enjoyed? My God. Um, <laughs> I have read Braiding Sweetgrass, The Road, so depressing. Um, the Great Mistake was a, just a surprise winner. It, it was about the, the founding father of um, New York's public library, the Metropolitan Museum and Central Park. And mm. it's fictionalized, but it's based in history. And that was phenomenal and such a great voice. There we go. Wonderful. OK. Uh, and, and last but most important, Kate, for those that, uh, that want to learn more about you, your work, your book, what's the, the one place that we should direct them to? So if you want to learn more about uh, Triple Win Advisory, go to triplewinadvisory.com and you can learn about all my consulting services. If you want to learn more about my book, um, go to kategartner.com. There we go. We'll have all that linked up in the show notes. Kate, thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, thank you very much.